Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, tell me, this isn't a tough path to follow. <laughs> I see your hands, Jerry. Does some of you know uh, George Goble? Remember what he said, what, what, remember what he said one time, Johnny Harrison said, I feel like a brown pair of shoes in the world's a tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, I, I'm Jerry Jackman. I, I was the executive director and our CEO of the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation for a long time. And uh, somebody, 30, 35 years, we include somebody every time I was there. And somebody once asked me, uh, how would you last so long as a nonprofit executive director? You know? And I said, well, I, I married a professional management consultant. <laughs> <laughs> Dodge profit management and so I swear to God I would have survived without without her all these all these years. The other thing is that Lynn Lynn Linda and I were a co well she was director of the Santa Barbara Historical Museum and I was the director of the Santa Barbara Trust. We're just a couple blocks away and we got to know each other. So 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 how about I get her to, to the shoot thing? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I'm going to tell you about that. So, I mean, we could start with the Bible if we want. You know? And uh, I, you know, on a vacation recently, I was reading. Uh, the, the, you can get a Bible still; they still have Bibles in motels. They've actually taken Bibles out of most motels now during COVID. Don't ask me why they did. That. They did, but I, so I started reading Leviticus. And it's all about sheep, you know, sacrificing. And so, turns out the biggest sinners that you had to sacrifice. Sheep, right? And many of you know about the Lamb of God. Christ was the Lamb of God. Well, I think what happened was God got tired of all these sinners and having to sacrifice sheep, so he said, I'm going to do it one more time with my son. And so that's why we have that from the, the Lamb of God. So uh, we're not going religious here, but I, <laughs> I just thought I would start at the beginning, sort of a, a Christian tradition. So, so, uh, now see if I can work this. I can set it up. So Spain, Spain has a really powerful sheep tradition. And uh, is anybody I know one person here knows what transhumance is? Who knows what transhumance is? If you do raise your hand. Ah, and you know why she knows it? Because her family is in sheep. <laughs> um, and they've been doing sheep for generations. Transhumans is where you migrate sheep from one place to another, right? And, and Spain was noted for that. They had kind of, this transhumans had happened around the Mediterranean quite a bit. Uh, but, it, but Spain was the, one of the best places because it has a pretty radical climate. You can always think of Spain as being hot, which it is. From Madrid down, but from Madrid north, it's it's more of a northern European climate. So they would migrate these sheep through here, and they would go. Uh, you know, you asked me the other day how, how far they would go, uh, and I didn't know, so I looked it up, and, and they would go as far as 400, 400 kilometers, which is about 250 miles. They would march the sheep. So in the summertime, the sheep would be up in northern Spain, and then some winter time in the south of Spain. And it's for foraging, and that's why they did it. Um, and so that's one of the key things. And, and today, of course, transhumans has been in decline, almost doesn't exist until about the 1990s, and they started bringing back. And they started marching the sheep. This is about, I think that's the Gran Via in Madrid. They now just remind people that they used to do this. They do march the, the sheep down right through Madrid, and they're trying to reestablish the original roads that go back and forth. Yeah. Did that replace the running of the bulls? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no, that, that's still there. Right, right. This is less dangerous. Uh, so, so there actually are, are shepherds that are doing this and reestablishing old ropes that they used to use. And so so sheep is a big deal. I think if I can bring this to work now. Um, this is somewhat out of date. You see 2012. Uh, I, I looked it up. I didn't have time to, to read 
issue, but at the time, uh, 2012, there were 16,804,000 sheep in the state. That's a lot of sheep. And if you look below the UK, it's that they're the largest in Western Europe. Today, they're still, they have 22 million. The, the most recent one, there's been a decline in sheep. I think it's, it's me, I think it's down to about 15 million. But it's a big industry even today. And it's really uh, important. I read this book, it's called Spain's Golden Fleece by a colleague, Brian Phillips. She's a fabulous historian. It's a 500 page book on, on, on the sheep industry from the 13th century all the way up to the 19th century. Uh, and it turns out that the sheep industry has produced more wealth for Spain than all gold and silver wealth that came from the new world. So it's a really important part of, of Spanish history that people kind of know about but don't know enough about it. And so I started being more interested in this as at the trust that we'll see why as we go forward here. So there's, there's various breeds of sheep, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be very simplistic. I don't know, I don't have a lot of depth and knowledge of this, but I know about the breed of sheep. And this is the famous sheep of Spain, right? And it's considered one of the great wolves of Europe. What's really great about the merino sheep is it's about 100% of its fleece is usable. It's a lot of, of, of sheep that's not usable. Uh, on, on the other belly and so forth, but with the merino it is, and they, they, they treasure this sheep to this day. It was brought over apparently by the Moors. Everything I, I've read so far said the Moors brought it over from Africa in, in about the 13th century. So it's not an indigenous animal, uh, but it's a very important one. Now, one one the uh, <coughs> Spanish and Columbus Company in the world, they're not going to let go of the merino sheep. This is too valuable. Um, England also has their own sheep, but the merino fleece is so valuable, they would set it up to haul it in various places. And so when, when Columbus comes to the New World and starts to sheep, he brings sheep on his second voyage already. I forget how many, I think it was like a hundred or more. I don't know where they put them all, but they brought a hundred sheep. And, and then, uh, but they weren't merino sheep. They were they were the churros, which you probably have all heard of. And you notice the difference to sort of curly fleece of the merino and the, the straight uh, fleece of, of the churro. So this is the this is the animal that came over with Columbus and it kept coming over. Uh, and then eventually it, 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 it became the only breed that was really allowed. I heard I read somewhere that Cortez had a handful of, of merino. And there's one other the merino sheep just didn't come through the Spanish uh, to the to the, to uh, Central America or to, to Mexico. <coughs> but in about 1800, an American consul or diplomat in Spain they cut a deal with the with the Spanish about the time of Napoleon maybe when it happened. And 20,000 merinos actually came to the the colonies was the states right there. So the first merinos that really came in large numbers, 20,000, actually ended up in the new uh, United States. But these were the, these were the sheep that came to, to the uh, Mexico or, or the New Spain, as it was called. And uh, they, they didn't really take root down in Mexico because of the climate. But right away, they did take root up in New Mexico. And uh, by Coronado, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but Coronado, came up to his Entrada, what was that, 1540? Mm -hmm. I mean, he, had, he had like two or three hundred sheep with him. And I'll tell you more about that because I have a huge amount of So these are the sheep that uh, came and said, okay, so why does Jack would get interested in this? Well, uh, we did lots of things at the San Diego Press. We made 100,000 adobe bricks. It's like plenty of fame. They weigh 55 pounds each, and that's the thing about that. We, we built about a third of the Presidio when I, I was there the Spanish Fort, last Spanish Fort built by the Spanish in, in, uh, in uh, the New World. So my, my organization got other things, we're still the Casa de 
here at Adobe. And we bought these mills right here. So on the left is a, a grist mill. Now this is 1818, about 1818, 1819 that these were built. But on the left is, is the grist mill. Of course, you all know what this mill is, but right. on the right, that other building is a fully mill. How many of those are fully mills? Fully? Fully. Well, there was one. That's about the normal. That's about what I get at audiences. Hardly anybody. Did you raise your hand for a fully mill? Okay, so that one is about what I used to find. So a fully mill is a place where you full mill. Now, this is a close up of the mill, and that's projected about the device, the machinery that was used for wool. Most we know that almost all wool is full. You know, we have to do it because one, it has lanolin in it. You have to get the lanolin out of it. And also the fibers are, are pushed together by this device. And I won't go into the detail, but the cloth is there and then the arms come down and you put the cloth in and it pushes this cloth and then you pour water over it. And again, they actually use urine as one of the common things to, to type in as well. But this has been done for centuries, millennia, but in different forms. And so it starts with the, the Romans in Pompeii, right? And so there, though, they didn't have the, the, the mechanical water. They didn't use it the way they did. But they use the slave, slave's feet to, to pull. So mm -hmm. the slaves, they put the water in there and put the wall in the slaves would do it that way. <laughs> okay. so, did you know that Don Quixote not only fought a windmill, but he fought a fully mill? This is a engraving that was from a, I believe, a 19th century edition of of uh, Don Quixote, one of my favorite books of all time. And you can see down below, I cut off Sancho Panza down below there. You can see him marching up. And the, what happens in the novel, here's this baby. He says, I'm going to say this, you know, I'm going to say this. And something terrible is happening. He goes up and he starts jousting this, this fully mill. So fully mills were big deals. And people knew about them all in Spain. And so they come to California in, in the Mainly in the 19th century. I don't think there is one of these in the 19th century. But there's different ways to fold. So this is a folding tub in Greece. And uh, Michelle and I came across this for one of our Greek adventures. And, and uh, they actually, you can't see this really well, but if you look, there's a, there's a drawing up in the top. You can probably see it a little better over the other one. And you can see a person standing if you look carefully. And he's, he's, he's got a pole and he's, he's pushing the, the, the cloth around. That's a very common uh, way of folding in Greece, I guess. But what's really interesting about all this, there are folding mills in California. One real one that I just showed you, and then there's some that I, that I think were partially built in California. And you can help me in the future. I have not found by Googling so far, any fully mills mentioned in New Mexico. So why is that? Does anybody know about that? Well, you didn't even know about fully mills. So. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, so there's, wherever you go, you, you run into sheep. So this is, we just come out and get on the sheep on the, on, the, on the road in Greece. And I couldn't go from this, this photo. And the sheep started coming to California in huge numbers. So if you look, see how it's underlined on this image here? Look, this is the uh, 1820 or 1850. So if you look at how many sheep were in California at this time, there were more sheep than there were cattle, more sheep than there were horses, and so forth. So why? What's going on here? Uh, there were a lot of sheep. So that's why there was a pulling. Uh, they were actually making blankets and so forth in, in California. Then there's New Mexico where you have, have, have a sheep tradition. Well, 
dollars, one hundred sixty thousand. I don't know. I think I put one in here. This this is the sheep at the same time, approximately the same time uh, in in New Mexico. There were two hundred and fifty thousand sheep in New Mexico during this time. And the question is, why? As we go down the Spanish Trail here, why all this wool goods are going to California when all this? You know, when, when all these sheep were in, in California. Well, I think uh, what was going on is that, first of all, the sheep distribution was there for about 200 years before and, and it had been developed. And I think that that may be the blankets and the serapes were probably far superior to anything that was happening in California. And then on the other side was California was now part of Mexico in the 1820s and it got into the hide and tallow trade. And the high, the high tallow trade just totally killed the, the, the sheep industry in California. So that by by 1830s, 1840s, that, that sheep number that you're looking at here is dropping down to like 20,000 or so. So the sheep world doesn't really exist. High tallow trade takes over. It was kind of awful in some ways. They, they would bring the cattle down to Gaviota, remember where Gaviota is, they bring dry the cattle down from San Inez. And then, by the way, that mission that I should be fully know that I showed you was the San Inez mission. But anyway, they drive the cattle down and they would kill them right there on the, on the near the beach and the cliff, strip off the hides, throw them down to the beach, and then boats would come in and they load the hides and then they take them back to New England. And um, then they just leave, there was, there was so much money just doing that. They would just leave the animals, the dead animals, right there. So then what happened? The grizzly bears started to come down, right? And the grizzly bears, were just the population of grizzly bears in the 1840s doubled in, in Alta, California. And then, of course, that all changed a bit later. Excuse me. So there's a lot of pretty interesting history related to these sheep. Um, so the other, the other thing is that the sheep industry did it's not the best picture, but it's supposed to be Armino Manuel, right? <laughs> but it was, uh, it's, I pulled it off the, uh, you know, online. So um, the, the Ricos were the ones who were benefiting from this trade. And so the, the, the Ricos were people like Armino and others. So there was quite a bit of wealth there, and that's one of the themes of the conference here, is that this wealth was being generated. This wealth also went, uh, or was generated by sending the sheep down to, to Mexico, uh, into the mining areas, and there it was used for consumption. I didn't mention this before, but the the, uh, the, the churro sheep are much better eating. They're considered really quality uh, lambs, so uh, they became popular for that. So, But they weren't shipped to California for that purpose during the Spanish you know, the Spanish Trail, uh, up to the 1840s. Then the gold rush comes, and then they start, the, the sheep start moving to California again. But they don't use the old Spanish Trail primarily, and there's some reasons for that. Um, this is not the best image, but you can kind of figure it out if you take a look at it. Um, sheep are not very good swimmers. And what is the best? Mammal that out of water for swimming. What's the best mammal that lives out of water for swimming? The horse. Horses are great swimmers. I actually did an article that I proposed that that the first exploration north of, <clears throat> north of San Francisco was they actually put the horses in the bay and swam across. And, oh no, they couldn't have done that. But then there was a, a horse blackie who actually did it in the 1930s for the Golden Gate. Pull the rope up, just one horse swam all the way across that area. So it, it could well have happened. So th this is what why the when the sheep sheep are now being shipped to California from from New Mexico, they well, took a southerly route. And to show that sheep, for example, of sheep not being good swimmers is uh, down down by the Colorado River, some some herder had pushed the sheep too far quickly get to the, to the river, the, the sheep started to sink and they got into the river and over a thousand sheep died from that, from that incident. 
So, so that's one of the reasons why they probably, if they would have you know, gone up the Spanish Trail, they would have had to cross rivers twice. And then I made it look kind of not the best way to go. So they start getting the southern route. So here you see a sheep that is hogtied to a horse. Right? That's how they probably would have had the gun. Uh, this, this photo I think is from the early 20th century. I can't remember. It's not from the time of Coronado, but this is what Coronado did. He had his 200, or they don't know exactly how many he had, but it's somewhere between 200 and 400 sheep when he did his Entrada in 1540. When he left uh, someplace in Nayarit, he came to the river and he had to hogtie the sheep to the horses. So each, each one of the uh, sheep had to be hogtied the, and the horse carried it across. And Cornell said, this isn't going to work. So they left the, uh, he continued on without the sheep. And then they would catch up sometimes later. But uh, again, it's kind of an interesting story why you know the sheep didn't get to California until the gold rush and then how, how they came and they didn't come over. So, uh, we're coming around that end here. Michelle wanted me to uh, put something to her in here. So, uh, this, this was a, a sheep dog. He said he was a sheep herder. He wasn't a sheep herding dog, and he really wasn't. So, I thought that was funny too. So, just to, to wrap this up, there are, let's see, today in, in the United States, about 5 million sheep. That's the number that I just, that's the 20, 2020 number. So what, what states do you think have the largest amount of sheep? What's Texas that? is number one. Correct. 700. Utah's, I think, number five on the list. Could be. I don't know where Arizona's Right. Who's number two on the list? New Mexico? California. I, I heard it. California? California. California has 500. A lot of the places like Utah, Arizona, etc. But today, remember, I, I, one of the statistics I showed you was that there were 240 sheep in New Mexico around 1820. How many today? Yes. Southern New Mexico has a pretty good industry. Yeah. Right. But what's the number? This thing is. 200,000. No, 90. <laughs> so, so they actually have fewer sheep today than they did. California had 180,000. Now they have that. I would say the vast majority are out in San Joaquin Valley and up in Northern California, above San Francisco. This way here. So I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that answers your question right now. But it's kind of interesting, isn't it? And I want to find out. <clears throat> If any of you can uh, find out anything about foaling in New Mexico, how they fold their wool, uh, that's kind of an interesting question that I'd like to be able to answer. I think uh, one of the differences, it looks like that, that the industry was more in private hands uh, commercially in New Mexico, it was done more with emissions in California, so we have, maybe have a little better records of it than we do in New Mexico, but you have to fold. You know, it, it, all wool is full. Just remember that. You know, you don't. What happens is there's different ways you can fold. But you take it's usually a cloth that's only been spun, and then they, they run it through. They get the lamin out, and they and they tighten the fiber. That's just how it's done. But people always kind of know about carding and the, and the looms and everything that they go on. So go learn something. Today. Question.